Hello and welcome to the Crate and Crowbar. This is episode 148, recorded on the 5th of July. I'm Tom Francis. With me here today are... Tom Zenia. And... Alex Wiltshire. And we have... Actually, before we get to like normal news, um, a small bit of pod housekeeping. I'm not going to be on the pod for the next seven weeks, because I'm going to Sweden to make games in a forest. In cabins. <laughs> <laughs> the cabins are basically just apartments, really. <laughs> it's, it sounds like log, you know, you think... Mm log cabins in a forest but no they're quite well furnished and nice apartments i was hoping for kind of i don't know like bull rugs and <laughs> smoke it's a bear grills game jam yeah yeah i don't know if it would help it's a weird thing because it's like um it's like a, an accelerator i think or you could call it a, tr- a retreat where like a load of developers all go there and um it's kind of sponsored by like moyang and rovio and people um and I guess the idea of all being like in the middle of the woods is partly to be isolated, right? Like normally like a writer's retreat would be where you cut yourself off from the world and you can focus on that thing. But we're going to have the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my primary source of distraction anyway. <laughs> so I think it's going to be more about just like being near other developers and that will be useful in its own way. In the wider games industry, there has been some news, hasn't there? Yes. <laughs> some uh, news surrounding Counter-Strike Global Offensive. And the fact that you can, there's, there are many black markets that exist in video games around items, especially ones that you can change, exchange and trade. And this one, uh, there's one for gun skins and stuff, and you can gamble on them, I gather. Yeah. So there's lotto sites. I don't know exactly how they work. Does everyone put in a, like a gun skin from their inventory and yeah. then they're all like in the pool and then just it picks a random winner or something? So you, I'm not sure if they all work the same way. As far as I can gather, you you have your gun skins in front of you, and they all have a value, the value mm. that they are. And then you gamble their value against uh, upgrading from those uh, skins to get more valuable ones, which you can then either keep, and then they're transferred to your account, or you can uh, cash in for their value. Which is usually below the value that you that you've just yeah. gambled away. And the specific scan, well, the yeah, the the breaking news, um, although it's really old by the time you hear this, <laughs> it's quite old today. Um, is that uh, two people who have done videos of these uh, of basically people record themselves on these, these gambling sites, and that's actually like quite a common kind of YouTube video is like people open, opening FIFA packs. We've talked about that before and just anything with an element of chance and an element of possibility of success is quite good YouTube content. And, um, pro syndicate and T Martin. I didn't know how to pronounce, pronounce it. On? I hadn't heard of him, but, um, uh, he's also someone with like a million followers or something. Um, have done videos on this, uh, site called CSGO Lotto. And, um, then a YouTuber called, for honor or honor the something for call, honor, I think. honor the call oh, honor the call let's say, yeah. um uh discovered that they own that site <laughs> and they didn't mention that in the videos they do in fact one of them uh, the martin guy specifically says like oh i just found this cool site and then uh, proceeds to show himself opening these uh or like doing these um bets and winning big of course and getting massively excited and winning like i think one of syndicate's ones like he wins like thirteen thousand dollars in 15 minutes or something and that's a bit dodgy if you own the site. <laughs> and so, like, the video, the one that got popular was by H3H. Wait, is it H3H3? Is that the name of the channel? Yeah, I think so. Um, which is uh, going off of uh, On Other Calls research and um, uh, bringing it to a much bigger audience because that's a quite well-known YouTube channel. And uh, he kind of focuses uh, quite a lot on the idea that those bids might have been rigged, which is, you know, Certainly the, that possibility is one of the many reasons you shouldn't do a video <laughs> of your own gambling site without advertising it. But also, like, it seems sleazy as hell even before that point, doesn't it? <laughs> like, even just sort of um, advocating the gambling thing to their incredibly young audience is kind of already quite unsettling. So Steam's... And then when it's also dishonest. Yeah, because on Steam you can do all this at the age of 13. There's uh, where Whereas kind of typical gambling... Yeah. Comes with much higher age ratings. And it's, I guess they're piggybacking off Valve's own, cause, you know, Valve also don't, uh, abide by, like, uh, don't have to worry about gambling laws because they argue that the things that people are gambling are, are not money. They're, they're serious go weapon skins. They're just purely a set of things. Probably, you know, in terms of use, Valve technically own them all. Um, but 
Uh, and I guess these sites kind of piggyback on that and say, well, well, our sites are also not gambling because if these aren't real money, then there is no um, sense in which you're gambling money. Um, but that seems untrue. <laughs> it does seem to <laughs> be some counts. money going in and money <laughs> yeah. coming out. It doesn't matter what the item is. I mean, if you're, you could you know, gamble for silver spoons and the fact that you can cash them in, that it means that they have monetary value. Yeah, uh, but yeah. It seems like the regulatory authorities uh, have got an extra kind of uh, layer of stuff to add to their legislation to actually allow them to look at this stuff properly. Yeah. It seems, like, it seems like it's definitely an area that should definitely be regulated, particularly because, as we've mentioned, it affects kids so much. Yeah. And that a lot of these people who are using these services are, are 14, 15 year olds. And that's the scary thing about Pro Syndicate and, uh, and the other guys, uh, YouTube channels, <laughs> because their, their, their audiences are skewed pretty young mm. and incredibly kind of impressionable. It's, this whole thing is so fucking bizarre. Like, this latest bit is just about the gambling, but then, you know, you take a step back and they're, they're trading, like, layers of paint on guns that have no effect on the guns, and they're hideous as well. Yeah, they, <laughs> are, so ugly. they are gross. Like, almost the more valuable they are, the more hideous they are. And they're all the things that I would have said wouldn't be seen as valuable by players. Like, you know, if you were trying to make... Um, if you look at, like, the skins in Overwatch have different tiers of rarity... And the highest tier ones are often like a bit more extravagant, but they're also like super tasteful. They're like a unified color scheme and they're like really stylishly put together. And, um, uh, they're the kind of things that you can sort of see why they think they're valuable, like a beautifully crafted, you know, statue or something. But then the CSGO weapon skins seem just <laughs> incredibly <laughs> garish, just thing upon thing upon thing, like layered on top of each other. So I don't know whether it's just pu- like purely aesthetics or purely, or like there must be an element of rarity coming in like they're, they're yeah, attractive sure. not purely for their I mean appearance. actually I, I can sort of understand that because uh, I find myself swayed by that even with Overwatch skins <laughs> I have to keep going back to that because that's the only thing only cosmetic thing I've cared about in years um, uh, but there is like there are some Overwatch beat classes where I probably the default skin is the one I would have picked if you gave me an even choice between all of them but because it's the default one if I really like that class, I can't stay as the default one. I can't be like default Hanzo. I have to pick some Hanzo skin. They're all bad, but... <laughs> like... See, this is why I never understood why uh, the attraction of buying the um, Overwatch Origins pack. Oh, yeah. Because that put a premium. Like, it was yeah. about 10 quid or more mm-hmm. for a set of skins and things, which every other person would have. Yeah. Like, so therefore, all you're saying is, hey, I spent more than, ever, you know, I ought to have done as well. It's worth it because it's the only way you can not look like Reaper as Reaper <laughs> without having to unlock something really expensive. <laughs> Same for Soldier 76. Like, the skin you get is way, but like, Soldier 76 is the most boring character design I've mm. ever seen Blizzard do. And uh, the founding pack actually turns them into a more fun, interesting. So I've got this stunt, I've, I've, yeah, I've got this stunt man as a drop. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, that's evil can like evil one. Some, that is actually, that's one of the only ones where I look at that and I just don't know who the fuck it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just stunt man. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, interesting this issue looking at how different games companies deal with it so for example blizzard have been at war with gold farmers for uh, for a decade now in world of warcraft and they've very very kind of seemingly aggressively chased down people who are using their system to create black markets and to generate profit from it and i, I wonder if that's uh, a moral thing or more that the FBI might be more interested in money laundering as a, a thing huh. as opposed to gambling as a, as a thing in the moment. Um, so what do you guys think about Valve's kind of, uh, what, what Valve's position is in this? Because it's very difficult. They, they, they could have anticipated this. Are they responsible for it? Or yeah. Um, so the, like, Valve have their own little gambling-esque thing, which H3H3 um, focuses on for a while in the video, that, like you pay for the key to a crate. And then when you open the crate, I don't know this, but in CSGO, opening the crate is presented like a slot machine. You see all the possible things sliding by and then it settles on one. So you, you like it acts as if you could have got that one. You were so close to that. <laughs> uh, which um, seems like both that and the general like crate and key system, I'm really surprised that they do it because it already just that by itself seems sleazy to me. Um, and I think all the reasons it works, all the reasons you shouldn't do it, <laughs> because it's addictive and because uh, people feel compelled to do it even when they're not being significantly rewarded. And it means that a small amount of content can be stretched the wrong way because people can just get dupes and dupes and dupes and keep paying and keep paying and keep paying so they know they could have got that thing. Mm. And that, that all seems like great reasons to not use that system unless you are like 
starving for cash. If you're a developer who's like, oh my God, our game's tanked and we just need to scrape by, like we'll do whatever. If the, a company like that was doing this system, I'd be like, eh, all right, I don't really like it, but you've got to do what you've got to do to survive. That's the only thing that works. But when you're Valve, why do you do the sleazy thing? Why don't you do the thing, nice thing and just relax? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess they can see just the sheer popularity of it because it must be driving, you know, like an enormous amount of uh, play in the game now, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, I, and now I don't really want to take the devil's advocate point because I don't support it but I can also see that a lot of players would be really angry if they took it out yeah that's probably true yeah that's probably I mean it's the same as true of gambling right there's a bunch of people who just healthfully enjoy it as a pastime uh, as a piece Poor of game unhealthy. design <laughs> yeah that's what I'm saying like yeah. both exist there are, uh, the fact that some people are able to enjoy it in moderation yeah. without it being a problem doesn't excuse the whole thing but the comparison with Blizzard is super interesting like it's the you know like where Blizzard are this sort of I don't know. They're like, they're like um, the, the USSR. You know, they totally <laughs> central control. Yeah, you know, right. like, and they will control every kind of arm mm. of the tentacle. You know, every tentacle of the octopus. Whereas, you know, there's the US of <laughs> the Valve states, <laughs> kind of just sort of you know letting everything go out to the market. It's and, the free market, right? You know, yeah, absolutely. Total mad free market. It does. It feels like. Yeah. It also ties into their culture of being very data driven and very experimental and just going with what the players seem to respond to. Because they're, they've always said that and they've always kind of, um, well, certainly since like Half Life 2, um, have been very like, well, let's just try a whole bunch of things and then see what people like. And, um, I was a journalist, so I used to get frustrated at interviewing them because they're like, I know they're great designers there. And I keep asking, what do you want this to be? What, what would you like to do next? And, oh, we'll just see what players like. And, no, you must have opinions. <laughs> and the, like, then if you're doing monetization stuff, of course, if, if you just respond to whatever works, then you, you get, you'll gravitate towards the kind of most exploitative things because that will, in fact, they've done talks about like how they don't do the exploitative thing of having a fake currency system like Xbox do and like, you know, most free to play games do because their experiment said it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> like that was the explanation of it. Like yeah. they didn't say anything about like whether they thought it was a nice or a nasty thing to do. They just tried it. It didn't work. So they didn't do it. <laughs> The hat economy, generally, like the, the stuff they put into TF2 and CSGO, is an, a, a kind of extraordinary example of introducing a market to something and then creating value for everyone involved. Like as a free market ethos, yeah. it's, mm. it's a like practical example of why it can work. But they're obviously this is the darker side of that, and you can't have one without the other. It seems like if Valve crap down on their own uh, on, on this sort of stuff, they have to restrict their own economy that they've created as well and I don't think they'd ever want to do that unless they were forced to because as far as they're concerned uh, it means that they've got content creators creating skins and hats uh, and that's good for the content creators because they get stuff but they're also generating stuff for the game which also keeps gamers interested and it's this loop of satisfaction and this gambling isn't actually affecting CSGO itself precisely yeah it's like I think they have thing. blocked the CSGO lotto site I think I saw I think that. that was a moderator that wasn't Valve itself oh, really? and it's been revoked as of yeah, oh, okay. this afternoon yeah, Valve are very. Um, I think they they're always are on, are on the side of not banning anything ever, and hmm. that they, they, they want to make it as free a thing as possible. And you know, they don't want to make a moral stand on take a moral stand on things. I've never really seen them actually close down stuff if it was too bad. The, the only exception to that is probably the tagging system, where they I think they came in and snipped a load of tags where they you know they have the, they introduced the tagging system for the first time, and uh, some of the most popular tags were like Hitler was right, and like that. <laughs> inevitably so because this is the internet, and you know uh, we're all children on the internet. Um, Jen got there. <laughs> yeah, precisely. But they, they, they think they did crack, crack down on that. Probably because it's just the PR disaster there is just too awful to. But this is turning into one, you know. Uh, I this think is so, the, yeah. You know, you can, you right, can right, see, so. you can see mainstream press yeah, saying sure. this is something to get yeah, right that, onto. Yeah, well, we were in an hour long meeting talking about it today, like a piece of mm. gamer, because like, it's, it's a big deal and it's only going to get bigger. Because it, it, it's not, this isn't the only example. There's a, there's a huge issue around kids gambling in games and stuff like that and the negative yeah. effects of it. It's going to be, it also feels like, I mean, mainstream media have covered YouTubers a bit, but it's always so far just been this kind of like head scratching, like, oh, this thing kind of exists. Here's one of those people, I guess. Um, and I feel like the first, there'll be, there'll come a time when something specific happens with the, with a YouTuber that makes the mainstream media yeah. pay attention. And that will be the impression that people just have of YouTubers. Like if this is it, if this actually does flare up with the mainstream media, then just the impression of YouTubers will be that they're corrupt, exploitative, 
Um, and they're kind of supporting all the bad the things about games that yeah. people suspected in the first place. Just, that won't even matter to the kids, but it's when, it's when the parents start hearing exactly. that stuff is, is when that, mm. that will really yeah. start affecting them. It's been interesting to see, like, obviously, I mean, completely predictable, but like, um, these, I think Syndicat's something like, I think it's 10 million followers on Twitter. I don't I I think assume he's, as I you think he's on something like that. 8 million on, okay. on YouTube. Um, and anyone with an audience that large has like a percentage of those people are just zealots, right? And they will just support um, yeah. him no matter what. And so, of course, this has been met with, like, fierce um, resistance from the people who like these YouTubers and who follow them. And just, I think, for a lot of people, just develop a really personal relationship. It's like their friends being attacked. And I don't know if the facts matter at all. <laughs> Maybe they matter a bit, but they're sort of like... I don't know. It's curious to see how they reacted, because um, uh, T. Martin... Um, went back and added disclosure to all his videos. Although even then it wasn't good disclosure. It was, uh, this video made possible by CSGO Lotto, which still doesn't say he owns it or has any affiliation with it. It's just like, of course, a video about CSGO Lotto was only made possible by CSGO Lotto. Um, but, you know, that was after the fact. And then he just sort of like claimed that that was there. Um, he's also saying that, um, that when he did the video, he would, didn't, he wasn't, didn't have a pressure despite being on the founding. Yeah. So those things, we will both see. those things are, are things where, like, I'm just hearing that that's the case, and I actually yeah. haven't, like, thoroughly So he's due it. to put out a statement today, any moment. Right. Oh. Hmm. But it's interesting because that's, that's kind of what you do if you have that big base of, like, um, several million people who want to believe you. You just put enough evidence out there, it just looks like, well, look, you can see. <laughs> My side is true. Yeah. And it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, but then those people aren't giving it scrutiny, so... Yeah, this one's going to roll on and on. I think we're going to, this will come back over and over again. Um, again, but, these people are in a position of massive success already when they started doing this. Yeah, this is, yeah that's true. This is quite recent. And the, like Syndicate has been a huge deal for years and years and years. It must have been massively rich uh, long before they started. So why do you do the sleazy thing when you're already rich? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, I'm not, it's not specific about gaming or Valve or YouTubers. It's actually just a complaint about human nature. <laughs> <laughs> just across the world, the sleaziest people are the richest people. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> On that happy note, what have you been playing, Tom? I've been playing a game that Graham has recommended on this podcast multiple times. Um, and to me personally, I think several times as well. And written articles about RPS. And I always ignored his recommendations <laughs> until recently he wrote an article about it on RPS saying it isn't that good. And then I played it. <laughs> and it's Concrete Jungle. Um, and it's it's so many things at once that it's quite um, tricky to describe. But uh, basically you're looking like a, an isometric view of a grid um, that is just empty land to begin with. Um, and you place buildings on it. And it's like uh, six squares by six squares. And each square is a building or a space for a building. Um, and in the basic game mode, you are um, placing buildings on there and they either um, improve the tiles around them or they um, kind of collect those improvements. So basically, that the ones that collect improvements tend to be houses. So the idea is you put like a green down and a green is a nice thing. So it makes you can pick a tile next to it and say, let's make that tile better. So the green being there is making that tile nicer. And then you place a house there to capitalize on that. And then you get one point. The green is like a plus one thing and the house collects points. Um, and then if you put, if you had like, um, six greens, how many squares surround a square? Is it eight? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's eight. Uh, if you had eight greens, you could place eight greens all around a thing and have them all make this same tile better and get up to eight points and then place a house there and collect all those eight points. Or you can even have the house already there and put the greens around them afterwards. Um, and, that's basically it. There are 200 odd buildings, um, with all with like different patterns of what they improve and, um, or in some case, uh, make worse. Some of them will like actually only have bad effects, only make the land around them worse. Like a factory will only make the land around it worse, but it gives you a lot of economy and economy is how you bu kind of unlock new buildings. Um, and then there are other ones where like they have a nice little bit of logic to them. So things like, I was looking at a restaurant and it makes things on one side uh, have more points and things on the other side have less points. And at first I thought, oh, that seems a bit arbitrary. And I thought, oh, no, I guess if you have a restaurant, like 
the front of the restaurant is a nice thing for the residents oh. and the back of the restaurant <laughs> is where they shove out all the garbage. Mm. And so it, it's roughly feasible that, you know, a commercial enterprise could have that effect. And so it's kind of, there's a lot of stuff like that where it's like, you know, there's not a one-to-one relationship between like just from knowing a building type, you could know what it does, but there's some logic there. You can see that like mm. just a beautiful statue just makes everything around it better and a factory makes everything around it worse. And um, uh, it's really cool. It's incredibly slick um, and it feels like one of those beautifully polished like mega commercial mobile games um, where, you know, whatever you uh, may like or dislike about Candy Crush, it's, you know... Uh, incredibly well honed in terms of like the experience and it's just really satisfying to click on things and it's, you're led into it really well and taught it bit by bit and it does that uh, and it's on PC so that uh, I think this guy's made mobile games before like mobile only games before I'm not sure um, Cole Jeffries is the name of the developer who does almost everything who does all of the art um, all of the programming all of the writing and um, design and uh, so it feels super slick and then it just never stops getting more deep and complicated <laughs> like you just every it's, there's like a campaign to it so you play what feels like a tutorial and then it just goes on on and on and it's got like a story and different characters who show up is it and, across individual levels are you building on the same yeah so you build each level is like that six by six grid once you oh yeah the actual goal is uh, what the reason you're trying to get these points is you want each kind of column to have at least three points in it. And once it's got three points, it falls away and the, you kind of scroll along one and you get another column at the okay. back. Um, and so you can do stuff like if you don't improve the, the column that's right on the edge and you improve all the others, you've got as long as you like to improve all those and make them incredible. And then you finish off the one that's actually next in the queue. And as soon as that disappears, they all disappear in a cascade. Like I think you even get bonuses moment. for that. Yeah. Um, and it's really satisfying to like make incredible, um, uh, incredible columns or incredible like you know beautiful bits of city that uh, yeah. just work really well um but as you're playing it, it's like it's doing that and then it's unlocking new buildings each time and then the character is talking to you all the time first character is like this um this lady who's it's all voice acted um uh it just goes like far above and beyond what it needs to be <laughs> in a way that like it's neither a criticism nor praise really <laughs> or I'm sort of impressed by it like the amount of, this extraordinary amount of work has gone into it I don't know how one person does um, all the art and the uh, programming design it's also like an incredibly well designed game it's so smart at every at every stage um, I actually kind of uh, messaged the developer to say oh did you ever consider do, making this mode work in this way and he would like to say it does work in that way <laughs> mm. oh okay so everything I can think of you've already thought of and done um, and uh, yeah it's sort of it, it's weird that it just keeps getting more intricate. So you make those columns, you've got to get them to add up to three or more. Um, and then that character who's talking to you, a new one gets introduced, who's like an incompetent mayor. And this um, uh, kind of intelligent young girl is, is trying to persuade him to like see sense. And then you unlock the ability to play as that mayor. And until now, you've actually been playing as the as the young girl. And the young girl's like all about the arts and about improving cities, making them nice and good. And the mayor is just... Um, incompetent uh but also rich and privileged and so uh depending on who you're playing as it has this whole huge skill tree of abilities so as you're playing placing these cards uh as you're so placing the buildings you're leveling up economy as you're getting more economy you're buying cards you buy more cards you get more technology technology ranks you up the skill tree and then you use your character to buy different like one-off abilities so that because the mayor is incompetent uh but rich he can do things like um at some point when you if you placed a lot of stuff they'll have a certain expenditure and once that hits a certain threshold now you've got to get four points in every column not three so it makes the game harder and that's a kind of inevitable thing but he has a skill called delaying the inevitable which means he postpones that for just for a while and that's what they kind of in some sense is a waste of a skill because you don't get it doesn't get any new cards it doesn't get any new points or anything but um it just staves off that for a while and so like and I think there were about eight of these characters, all with a completely yeah. unique skill tree with like themed abilities that match their personality and also the character of the city that they would develop. And then it introduces versus mode, <laughs> which is um, uh, the same thing, six by six grid, and you still place buildings, but now the two rows on the far side are colored in your color and two rows on the other side are colored in the enemy's color and only you can build in your reserve space and only they can build in their reserve space and then there's a neutral ground between you where you can both build and you are trying to get more points than them in each column so if they've got two points in that column they're in a strong position they're like if they get one more point then they win that column um 
And if you get more than them, if you got three, then you would also win that column. And if you both have three, you both get three points. If you both have less than three, you both get the, whatever, how many points you put in that column. Um, but if one of you is winning, uh, and you have more points than the other one, if they had four and I had three, they get seven. They steal your points. And that's the suggestion I made to him because I, I played it like I had a couple of rows where we had either had the same score or neither of us had won the column and we both got all the points that we played. This is against AI or whatever. Yeah. Uh, you can play against other humans because it's got every feature ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can play against other humans, but um, I was just playing against AI and I noticed that like the first few columns that went off, it was giving me both of us all the points. And so I suggested, oh, you should you have a mode where like only the winner gets all the points because then it would be really... Be like Gwent, you know how yeah, Gwent you kind of like you Gwent, pick a yeah. column to like I'm just going to win this one. I have to win sure. this one, yeah. and then the more you double down on that, the more you have to win <laughs> this one because now if you don't, you're just fucked. Yeah. Um, and then it turns out it does work like that. And not only does the winner get, um, uh, not only is the winner the only one who gets the points, he also gets all of the enemy points as well. So the more heavily you invest, the more points you're giving away, and it also means you can have a situation where, and I've had this several times, um, you put a bunch of points into a column and then the AI just has a, like some master stroke and they get, they pull just ahead of you. So you've got, they've got four and you've got three. So you're both going to win, but he's going to take all your points. And then you realize, well, I can't actually get ahead of him. I can't get five. I can maybe get four, but um, what I can do is I can place some, like a shitty factory next to his stuff and debuff it and it will take him down. Um, or maybe you can't get anywhere near his buildings, but then you realize like, well, if he's going to get all my points, I could just tank my own points. <laughs> so you could just build a factory in your reserved space, like shitting up all your own buildings, uh, because it's going to reduce your score on that column enough that he will lose those points instead of gaining them um, <laughs> and be totally fucked. And the versus mode is like, uh, so, you know, it's already getting quite complicated, that game. And not in like a messy way. It's really elegant. It, it uses one thing at a time. You fully understand each thing before you move on to it. Um but it becomes just incredibly deep. There's just so much to think about, so many decisions going into everything. Um, and then versus mode is just that times two, because now everything, all that stuff that just debuffs territory, that used to be so simple. It was just like, you just don't want to use it. Or if you want it, if you're going to use it, put it in the corner and just forget about it. Now that's your attacks. And that's how you, you deconstruct the enemy territory. You like try and fuck up their side of the street. Um, and it's also incredibly like, personal <laughs> it's like super stressful to play it's really um because there's it's such a deep game every decision it just takes me like minutes to place every building and you have to fill i think uh default game length is like 60 columns so 60 times six buildings <laughs> potentially you, you can progress by placing less than that if you have enough points um but the, like a one versus game a normal like Single player game match will take me like 10, 15 minutes. A versus game will take me at least an hour because it's just intense thought. And when you have a plan and you go for it and then on their turn, they just do something like out of the blue you didn't know they could do. It's just heartbreaking. <laughs> like it's one of the only turn based games I've rage quit. <laughs> fuck it, fuck this, fuck. And also, Although it is good at explaining its rules, if there is a single rule you don't understand, you are fucked. It will lose you the whole game. I just did something where um, uh, I had had one thing where I just I placed what I thought was I placed a market garden next to farmland, and I thought a market garden was like a farmhouse, but it's not. It's like farmland, and so I boosted points instead of collecting points, and ended up with no points and it lost me the game. And then another time, I. Just didn't know how... Oh, one time I just misclicked. Like, there's a little icon in the bottom left-hand corner that looks like a deck icon, and I thought I could review what the rest of my deck was. And by clicking on that, it just placed the building I had selected in the nearest slot it could, which is miles away from my cursor. <laughs> and if you place a building in the wrong place in a versus game, you're fucked! The game is over! You can't recover from that. It's just always fatal. There's nothing you can do. If you don't do everything at least intelligently. It doesn't have to be the perfect move, but you have to have... Every move has to be considered. You place one building in the wrong place. You've lost that super valuable building. You've ruined that space. You failed to capitalize on the like crucial advantage that you were in the middle of working on. And then every now and then, like the businessman, the, the sorry, the mayor, um, who's corrupt, he has one of his abilities is called invert and it just flips the points of a tile. So if you have, like, if you just have a plus one, he does it, and you've got a minus one, you're going to lose that column. That's enough to lose that column, but it's not so bad. But if you're, like, winning a column and 
you know, let's say you had that situation where like he's got four and you've got three and then you race ahead of him and you get five and now you're already happy because you're going to get nine points because you're winning. Um, and then he inverts your five. Now you've got minus five <laughs> and you're going to lose all five of those points instead of gaining nine points. So that's like 14 points difference. And sometimes the final score will be like 30 to 20 or something. So <laughs> that's just, it's the end of the game. Like there are so many things that are just such good plays or such terrible plays or such crucial mistakes that you just can't go on. I had one game where like I I thought I'd had that. I had this really elaborate plan going on. And then the thing that tripped me up was that he just, uh, you know, I was saying before, if, if the sort of current column, the the new, uh, the oldest column rather, um, is completed, then it disappears. If it's not completed, then you can just carry on working on everything else and nothing changes. And I'd just forgotten that that column was still in play and that he, you know, you get three placements each on your turn. So on his turn, he could fill in the three blank spots it has and they have no points, but it would just resolve that column. And then all the columns behind it were already resolved. He already had a lead in most of them, or I had a lead in one of them. But the thing I was trying to set up was to steal his lead in this other column. And I, I put so much work into it. And I was like one point away from overtaking him. And because he just he just forced the issue, he hadn't gotten a lead. Uh, he hadn't improved his lead or, did, or taken any of my points. He just made it so that all the columns were resolved now. I uh, lost all the points I'd invested instead of gaining all the points he'd invested. And uh, at the time, it was totally devastating. I rage quit. <laughs> And then when I came back to it, I realized we're actually just neck and neck now. It's like halfway through the game, we're neck and neck. But it's so emotional and so dramatic <laughs> that at the time, there was no way I was going on. I was just, fuck it, I can't do it. I've lost everything. My life is over. And then you come back and you're like, oh, we're neck and neck. And we've got 40 columns to go. I can win this. <laughs> <laughs> I love that they've uh, created so much drama out of a game about adjacency bonuses. Yeah, I'm really... <laughs> I, I really need to kind of figure out why it so, feels so brutally personal. I talked to Graham about it now that I, I know the game and, um, he says he actually stopped playing when he got to the versus things, just found it brutally difficult. It is brutally difficult. It's like 10 times harder than the single player stuff. Well, it's all single player, but, um. Just because of the sheer number of extra variables. It's, it's kind of the AI up. is, um, the AI just knows everything, I guess. Uh, it's not, amazing that the AI works so well given yeah. that it's such a complicated game and you I've, I'm, I know I'm reading way too much into it but I see things where like he doesn't do an obvious move and I'm like shit why didn't he do that and as soon as I go oh my god he's got something <laughs> oh shit he's gonna play me if I take that column he's gonna flip it on me and sometimes he does and I, I I'm you're calling reluctant. him he, you're calling the AI he as yeah. well <laughs> funny enough I, this is um, probably some terrible latent sexism but I found myself doing that even when he's playing a female character I always say he, because, and I talk out loud the whole time I'm playing, because it's so complicated that you can't leave anything in your head, you have to get it all out there, like, okay, why is he doing that? He's doing that because of this, but if I go there, then I could take away a hit point from there, but I could just take away a point from that column, but that column, I don't know if I'm going to win it, and if I don't win it, then he gets all my points. <laughs> It sounds fucking exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how like such a sort of fundamentally glowing. It's one of those sort of reviews yeah. or something where it's, which is fundamentally glowing that you kind of go, I don't want to play that. <laughs> so you can just play. Um, you play the campaign. Unfortunately, it does it puts versus missions in it, and I think you can't progress until you do at least a few of them. Um, but you can also just play the game in custom mode, and by the time you hit versus, you've learned, I think, probably, hopefully, everything there is to know about the basic mode. And then you can just play that basic mode as a custom game, as a one-off thing. And that's just really addictive and just really satisfying. And there isn't, it doesn't have that, that feeling of being overly personal because no one can, no one fucks you over. You can only fuck yourself over. And it's also quite easy in general. Um, I can't, I don't think I've ever had a, a non-versus game that was difficult or certainly I've never lost one. Hmm. Um, and I think just once I had a column that didn't add up to three. And that's like a, there's an inbuilt mechanic for that you just lose a life and, there's ways of gaining new lives and I hadn't even paid attention to that system because it never happened until that point. So like the basic game is just a really good, um, I hesitate to call it a casual game, but it's like the polish of a casual game yeah. with the depth of like a, um, it is a deck building game. Like those buildings you play, so technically a deck mm. and you build a deck before. Oh yeah. In addition to choosing your character, you also completely customize your deck if you want to. Um, and, oh, God. <laughs> uh, like I say, there are over 200 cards and also there's like a persistent, unlock system so that everything you do whether you play custom games or versus or the campaign is getting you your points to reach a new level and when you reach a new level you unlock new cards that you can put into your deck <laughs> okay I do really want this on iPad actually I feel like it's a 12 hour flight it sounds yeah, like I it wonder, should be yeah I wonder if it is I think his last game was um, but yeah it's it's an amazing achievement I can't believe it exists <laughs> uh, and it feels like uh, Cole Jeffries has like 
clearly all the skills you need to make a game. He obviously has used voice actors, and I think um, uh, I think he's licensed some music. I don't know if it has any original score, but um, uh, it has licensed music. And there's a like quite cleverly a uh, checkbox on the main screen that says, "If you're streaming this game, check this so that we don't play any licensed music that will get a copyright claim against huh. it." Which is really so smart it's got it. every single feature. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly, and that's that's, that's really clever. Yeah, that's really good. It's not yeah. But uh, I feel like the one role he hasn't done for himself is like an editor or a producer. Yeah. They just say like, <laughs> not, it's not that what you're doing isn't brilliant. It's just that you probably don't need to do that. You probably just skip 10 of these features. And <laughs> Tell you what, put that in the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Versus Mode could have been a whole separate Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well. And I would have happily bought it. <laughs> oh, I've been playing this. Sounds great. Alex, what have you been playing? Loads of shit, I hear. Well, yeah, so I've been playing... Uh, kind of everything and yet nothing <laughs> because I I finally finished upgrading my computer uh, and I put a new graphics card in it. Hmm. One of them newfangled ones that goes... Which, which one was it? Just the, the uh, it is a NVIDIA 1070. Four. Yeah. Four. Four. I thought, I thought, Tom, that it was <laughs> going to make everything like amazing and better. Hmm. And like it's faultless. Like it's amazing. Everything runs at perfectly smoothly all the time yeah but games haven't got better no what's all that about bit. yeah a little bit I've been playing The Witcher a lot over the last few oh, I don't know feels like a lifetime yeah, a it's great a wonderful wonderful lifetime uh, and it's just been sort of stuck in 30 frames a second all this time which has been perfectly fine yeah now it's not it's much smoother and yet it's totally just for what just <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Which is nice as well because, you know, it hasn't changed. But it, yeah, there is that little emptiness uh, in the upgrading kind of um Yeah, the play cycle. crisis for five minutes and then it's like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so when you're playing a crisis. I went through a lot of games. <laughs> yeah. Just like, oh, that's what it looks like an old chart, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Five minutes up. <laughs> Next yeah. one. There's, a, there's something that says that you look at graphics for 10 minutes and then if you're already into the game, the rest it just kind of fades to the background mm, and that becomes yeah. the accepted level of detail. Um, obviously I still buy loads of, I spend loads of money on graphics cards and just to do it a bit out of some kind of weird compulsion that I don't understand, but maybe, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll stick with my 970 for a decade. I think my exception to that is game you've also been playing Far Cry Primal. Yeah, so that, that, that was like my old graphics card probably wouldn't have been able to handle it because it's never done the Far Cry right. yeah. games that well. Um, I, I love two. I love three. I bounced off four just mm. completely. I don't know what it was. I just totally bounced off it. I think I was just UB, UB map itis. I think right, that yeah. I just felt really tired about yeah. another map to fill. So I kind of, when Primal started getting previewed and things, I sort of, the owl, the owl. I was like, <laughs> what on earth is this? And, you know, I, I just didn't get it. I did not get it. And like, you know, I just, and then I saw um, Tom's screenshots. <laughs> that he was the, these incredible valleys and beautiful colour schemes and trees and so I I tried that out, I downloaded it and um and it is really nice. I really like it. So everything else I played for about five minutes each. That one I've sunk much more time in. Awesome. And it's just like Far Cry my experience of the previous games was really scatty, you know, you kind of you kind of zip into somewhere and then you're out and everywhere kind of looks the same. And it, I don't know, I didn't really get a feel for places mm. in, in the previous games. Um, but in this one, you know, I just go on these journeys. Like it's so nice. And, you know, and because time of day affects your experience of a place so yeah. much, it's just, you know, and you're walking through these forest glades and you suddenly crest the hill and there's a valley before you with all these incredible creatures in them. And, um, and then as Tab- saber tooth tiger comes along and kind of kills some, some Neanderthals and like, it's just like really, really lovely. This is, uh, it's fascinating because you bounced off Far Cry 4 and I did as well because it probably, because it felt too similar to 3, even though it was it's still a great game. Yeah. Um, and yet, yeah, Primal kind of uses the same, not the same map, obviously they've done, redone it aesthetically, but structurally it's the yeah. same map, isn't it? Mm. And to have such a different experience. It, yeah, you'd never know. It's such a weird, there was quite a fuss about it when that was revealed, and I was deep into Far Cry Primal right when that happened, and I was just like, I can't you'd never imagine know, no. <laughs> Like, it's just a totally abstract concept to me. It's like if you said, oh, all of this is secretly the same colour as Far Cry 4. <laughs> well, I don't know what that means. Like, it, <laughs> nothing I'm seeing relates to Far Cry 4. And I think, yeah, it's quite a naturalistic environment anyway. So, I mean, you know, it's really hard to memorise 
places in Primal and from what I remember of Far Cry 4 because mm. it's hills and, you know, it's just yeah, nothing to really peg, yeah. peg on to. So, um, yeah, you didn't, just seems, yeah, totally redundant that they did that. I mean, I was just, that's good though, being efficient because yeah. they put some time instead into actually re- really mixing up Far Cry. It's like, you know, I'm sure you talked about it when you were, t- you know, on the podcast when, when you were playing it, but, you know, making you so grounded and making everything close up because you can only do things as far as you can mm. throw oh, yeah. a, a yeah, bow at them. Mm. There's no sniping. And it's, well, I suppose they're actually... Throw your bow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think tactic. there's a long bow, which I think zooms in a little bit. So, yeah. But I don't think that it's really going to change the scale at which you fight much. Um, no. And, you know, and your view is generally constricted because you've got such a lush kind of vegetation around. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're constantly turning around and you're seeing, you know, this kind of discreet new location that, that was right next door to where you were but unknowingly yeah. it feels everything's really close together really intimate feeling um really kind of earthy you might say huh. which is very fitting that's, that's I love how wild it is yeah it's like it's just teeming with life and that stuff you sort of have to care about it as well like because a lot of it would attack you <laughs> yeah it feels really dangerous uh although <laughs> that closeness of life so it feels like you're in a playground a lot of the time so you just you, you kind of think about like sort of pri- you know prehistory earth or you know like prehistory europe which i think is where it's meant to set and mm. you know sort of like where man, you know, humankind is spread out across, you know, and they're hunting and they probably don't see each other for days. Here, you're hearing <laughs> shouting all the time. It's like, it's like you're living in a kind of really, really violent neighborhood, <laughs> like with all these voices kind of shouting and screaming yeah. all the time. <laughs> so it's a really busy, really busy place. I love, I enjoy that too, because it's whenever someone is yelling, something's going on. Like you, you run to investigate a yell and it will be, most often a tribe fighting an animal like or you watch the tribe hunt some dogs or something and then they'll get attacked by a bear while that's happening and then while they're fighting a bear another tribe shows up but it's an enemy tribe so they start fighting the tribesmen and the bear yeah. and the bear catches fire <laughs> and then a man turns up and just sort of <laughs> whacks them all can you you can tame animals is that right in mm. this game yeah you sort of wave at them and they yeah it's the, the process of doing that is pretty lame you just like throw some meat down and then they eat the meat and you just press a button on them and now they're yours forever. is there any like i haven't noticed like I've, i managed to get a very fierce kind of lion a cave lion and it was no more challenging to do than a than a dog oh no yeah the taming process is i think the same there are some legendary creatures where there's a special quest to tame them okay. and they are like better but to be honest, I stopped using the pets uh, because they just make the game so easy. Like, yeah. it's your combat just becomes trivial. Stealth is basically stealth is now too unreliable. Even if you have a stealth focused pet, uh, it will just sometimes be seen by the enemy and just uh, count against your which, stealth. Which region. pets are stealth focused as opposed to uh, a <laughs> black leopard? I think is the the stealth king. Yeah, I think there's like, a, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like cats generally are stealthy. Dogs. I wish they. Yeah, I wish I that system worked better for me because I think A, I want them to be less on a power spectrum because like the early ones are just shit and the later ones are just incredible. Um, both sides of that are bad. Like I, I want my pet to be just always roughly the same power and then to pick one based on like what animal I like and also on its special abilities because they have different abilities. And the dogs, uh, so cats are stealthy. Dogs will run and fetch things for you. So they go over to bo- bodies and like search them for you and then bring you the stuff back which is really cute and nice. But it doesn't matter because the dogs are shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just quite a bear or a cat. Yeah. But they are, like, you can pet them and they've got this, like, incredibly furry face no. looking up at you and it's sort of, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> can they die? Or, like Far Cry 2, no. do they deploy a flare? You can. That you then it's, it's, yeah, there is, <laughs> that would be great. It's it's weird, <laughs> like, I got... I, <laughs> so I, weird! Yeah. <laughs> you kind of develop, I like, did... Like, you know, the first wolf that I had, like, I did kill it. And you can just go up and revive it if you get it in a certain time. If you don't get there in a certain time, it just dies. But then you can call one immediately back. Oh, right. You can yeah. swap it from a little menu. I mean, I believe that most cavemen had that at the <laughs> time. That's hilarious. That's, I think the main, like, I would just love it if taming an animal was like... I actually really like the way taming works in World of Warcraft, where you have to have a fight with the animal, and you just have to sit there and take it. Like, oh, they yeah. fight you and you just don't yeah. know anything about it. You just say that you're channeling your taming spell or whatever, which is mm-hmm. makes no sense. But they're just like, my pink flamingo that I tamed was, uh, I was, like, still remember 
just standing there and letting it claw me and claw me and claw me, going lower and lower in health. Like, oh shit, can I take this? And then eventually they just kind of calm down and then just like, okay, now we have a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it works. I wish like in Far Cry, I'd almost like to have to like leave the animal all the way back to my village or something and then keep it in a cage for like a, you know, a day or something and then visit it and feed it all the time. And then eventually it comes to trust me and then I, then it's my pet. And then if it dies, it's gone forever. And then that you'd be so invested in that. Yeah. That'd be so much more. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is an element of where you have to sort of hunt the one that you like because it's quite tricky to get them to attract, get attracted to the meat you put down. But I haven't played enough to really. One thing I'm like, I'm, I'm suspect given it's Far Cry, it'll do a little bit of an about face on this. But at the moment, I'm early in the game, and we very Homo sapiens kind of style cave people um, are against the flesh eaters, the Udam or something <laughs> yeah. like that. And, um, they are evidently Neanderthal. And there's something, I mean, I've, I think that it's going to do an about face on this. We're going to discover that they're all kind of, they are actually quite sympathetic. But at the moment, they are evil, brutish kind of <laughs> brutes who, who kind of don't deserve, who get killed in they enormous quantities. Smash up the lesser species, basically. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Which is very much counter to modern scientific thinking. Yeah. <laughs> The Far Cry always has it. Like, Far Cry has always been about wading into a, a situation you do not understand and just killing people almost at random <laughs> based on uh, like a tiny amount of information, especially like three. It's, it's like, impressive that they it. managed to actually port that ethos all the way back into <laughs> <laughs> we don't even recognise Yeah, they managed it. <laughs> Brilliant. I didn't, so I didn't really twig, I didn't really see them as like different. I didn't notice the physical differences so much. I just noticed they had red on them a lot. So they were yeah. enemies. <laughs> and then later on, there's blue enemies. They're blue ones, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they like fire. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. What have you been playing, Tom? Um, I've been playing, for no reason I can discern, Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. <laughs> Wow. I know. Wow. <laughs> right? That was a, that was from the left field right there. So didn't expect that. Um, That's a big game. I got so frightened of it because it's so big. enormous. Uh, but it's, it's kind of, it's really fun in a completely disposable way, which is absurd because it, it's a very disposable fun thing that is like 250 hours long. <laughs> so those two, those two facts just You can like, dispose just of 250 hours very easily. <laughs> yeah. And I, for some reason, I, I bought all the expansions in the Steam sale. So I thought this would be a rolling project. I'm going to get to the fucking end of Kingdoms of Amalur before I, wow. before I die. Uh, and it's, it's got some fun like pirate DLC and the, the DLC is supposed to be generally quite good. But uh, as a kind of throwaway RPG, uh, it has really strangely satisfying combat where it's a third person thing where you, you've got a lot of different weapons and it's probably closest to God of War in a lot of ways. It does the... Um, the Zelda thing where when you hit something, it registers hits by freezing for a frame mm. or two, oh. which is that you, you don't really see that very, uh, very yeah. much anymore. And uh, so much of the game is a throwback in the same way. And uh, particularly, like, for the last few years, have you, have you seen anyone standing underneath a giant yellow exclamation mark <laughs> <laughs> ready to while. give you a, qu- uh, a quest? Because uh, that is Kingdoms of Amalur right there. And, and it, uh, playing it, it was like going back in time, and it was only like released five or six years ago, something yeah, like that. Yeah. But already, things have, with the, with The Witcher Three and things like this, things have come along so far in the RPG from this from this old game that uh, I found it quite encouraging. Actually, it, was, it let me trace the the progress yeah, yeah, yeah. of the RPG in such a short amount of time. Because it was made over quite a long period, wasn't it? It was um, it was kind of like a passion project of uh, <laughs> the baseball player Clint. Yeah, I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name either. But it, 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 it's an extraordinary story. I think. It belongs to an American state now, somehow, because like the, the project yeah. imploded so drastically. But I'm pretty sure the state reclaimed the assets. The stu- yeah, the studio was uh, yeah based in Boston, and it was very, very highly subsidised by the um, by Boston Council or whatever. They, they, uh, this is a classic story of someone who wanted to make an MMO and then settled for an RPG instead, which is why it's so fucking huge mm. and why it's so bloated as well. There and is why it's got exclamation marks. <laughs> absolutely. And all that stuff. And the, the, the zones feel a little bit like MMO regions. I'll be a bit prettier actually. It's, it looks, it's not a bad looking game. It's got some like, it's bright and colorful and kind of lurid in the way that you, that is, it's fun to just kind of go into a cave and see those bright blue fungus everywhere. You come out and you're in this kind of verdant green place. It's, it's got that nice kind of flow of colours as you go through the areas. Um, and there's, as long as you don't do any side quests, just go for, through the main quest. Don't do any of the bloat. 
and just kind of enjoy your weapons and settle on the style that you want to play. It's actually a really surprisingly satisfying RPG that you should definitely pick up in a Steam sale for about £3. (laughs) Uh, And it's good value, I'd say, if you're looking for that sort of game. There was something else I've been playing. Have you tried um, 35mm? No. No. What is that? It is a miserablest, (laughs) post-apocalyptic Russian kind of... Well, it's it's pretty much a walk em up, um, and it's incredibly atmospheric and kind of weird and really interesting. Really, 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 kind of. I say enjoy. I can, mm. I have kind of enjoyed it. Yeah, had an good. experience. Right. If I had an experience, yeah, it's some um, um, sort of uh, very grey. It's very stalker like. Mm. Um, uh, very much that atmosphere. A journey with these two men uh, who don't say an awful lot to each other, all in Russian, but with um, English subtitles, which are very badly translated, um, which just adds to it for me. Um, uh, and it's just, yeah, you it's got that little promise to it where they you just don't know quite what's going to happen next, where so far it's been pretty much just walking from place to place and just going in houses and coming out again. It's actually quite open in open levels, but, um, has this charming thing. If you go too stray too far into a forest, it'll say, you don't have to go far. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest phrasing of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so you go back again and it's like, Oh yeah, I, 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 I'm pleased. This is bounded. This is nice. Mm. Um, but um, but it has like it's it's always suggestive that it might ask you to do something deeper than just exploring, or at least it has that capacity, which actually makes it feel quite a lot deeper than than it actually is. Which men it gives it sort of extra substance. Um, but yeah, um, I recommend it because I think it was it's I think it's cheaper generally, but in the Steam sale it's super cheap. Super. Hmm. So intense. Are you showing me that? Um... You are a big fan of House of the Dying Sun. Yes. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, your, I believe your recommendation of it was just to type its name in capital letters repeatedly. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Have you been playing it? Yeah. So I talked about it a bit last week or, or whenever it was on the pod. Um, uh, and I didn't get on with the combat as well as, or I didn't find the combat yeah. as satisfying as I expected to because I'd heard Graham talk about it as being like the sort of, the one space game where it feels like FPS combat, where like you're flying a gun virtually. And I think they've changed something where the, the ship you start in isn't the one that he's played with or something. But I was interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, it's a lot more, I suppose I was expecting, so I, um, I was expecting it to be like X-Wing TIE Fighter, like a set of very, you know, like a, a strongly narrative driven set of kind of, encounters like one after the other each of them quite intricate and while the encounters are quite intricate like you know things happen within them um i played kind of them all on the easy level so you get to choose to play the level on one of three difficulty settings Mm. and i went through a lot of them on the first difficulty settings and i was just like breezing through them like yeah it's it's easy mode it's genuinely easy yeah it's super easy and it also makes you think that kind of oh there's not i'm not really doing anything special like i'm not really exploring you know you can up you're upgrading your craft as you go along at at one point you're then able to have wingmen which you can then actually fly as or and also command in a similar way you could in X-Wing and TIE Fighter and stuff but um it all felt really slight and I thought oh it's not got it's not the deep kind of space combat sim that I was kind of expecting it to be hmm. um but then I tried it on higher levels and uh <laughs> like it co- comes far more alive like there's right. much more threat and there's much more going on the web like the, the feel of the the actual combat I did like it. I think I got quite a lot. Of, I felt there was feedback. I think I think space combat games are really hard to make. Yeah, I've, well, like the thing I said about last time was basically, uh, although I didn't like the combat that much, I I was playing it mostly because I was curious to see if this would be the only space combat game that I like at all. <laughs> because yeah. I've never liked one. I've never the plenty of space games I've played and that like got something out of but it was never the combat the combat's always been like oh, I just dragging my fucking hull up and up yeah, and yeah, up yeah. to track uh, the thing track and then press up, the button yeah the um, 
the that I mean it made me think back to why I liked Tie Fighter in particular so much. And I think it was it was really the sort of um the structuring of the missions, I think. The way that you got this sort of they would start you, you know, uh investigating, you know, sort of um scanning some canisters and then something would happen like oh there'll be hmm. some escaping sort of rebels on one of them so you have to go off them and then suddenly like a, a rebel kind of capital ship jumps in and then oh my god everything's changed and you're having to react to it and you might be having to defend things and while the combat in itself isn't particularly interesting actually um the speed at which you need to you know you need to sort stuff out so you can then zip off over to the other side of the kind of the area that you're fighting mm. but I think that's where it was kind of active for me it was like an, an imaginative act rather than a kind of an action act yeah the free space 2 is amazing for that as well like um free space 2 kind of picked that up and added the spectacle element where the capital ships like you're fighting nebula a lot of the time um and a capital ship just emerging out of the fog, firing lasers at another capital ship that is bigger than your ship, uh, and you, you're kind of you became this insect. You, you mm. weren't important really in that. Mm. It's like just a, you had some objectives, but the the bigger things were fighting, and that's what, what was important. And that the, that was a that's a magnificent feeling that I've not yeah. seen recaptured really. Mm. Um, they, they, they sort of uh, touch on it in um, House of the Dying Sun when because they've got this battleship that appears. Uh, yeah. which is the kind of, for me, like, I thought, oh, it's the Splunky ghost of, uh, yeah, very much. of this game. Like, <laughs> that, that's what comes to wipe you out if you're here too long. And that generated kind of a really interesting pressure. I like, I had some good experiences of kind of warping out at the very last second as it was kind of approaching. Yeah. Um, but I think the biggest problem for me with the game was I, I kind of enjoyed the, the kind of dogfighting to an extent, but it felt like a lot of the complexity was in the loadout system. Yeah. And I, I, I don't care about loadout systems. I don't find them fun. I didn't get far enough to even get any options for that. I was just always given a thing. And then I, I, I would click to like edit loadout. And then it's like, oh, you can only have this gun. You can only have this health. You can only have the ship. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, once you complete other missions, you unlock options, for weapon options. Right. And so some of them are hard counters for certain types of ships that you'll encounter in, in missions. So I felt as though on the harder difficulties, I was going up. And as long as I, if it's just like, equip the right thing then just fly forwards and kill it with the thing hmm. and uh, there's a really neat thing where you can pop into the map and actually control your forces like an RTS hmm. and I never really felt the need to do any need to do that uh, it felt like just pointing them forward pushing them forwards would do the job I'm not sure if I've, I've, I've that I did experience. a bit but only on so- certain missions where I was just finding myself where you're flying towards uh, some enemies and because you've got no cover in a, in a space yeah, and space shoes that you kind of they just pump you know you just get wrecked because yeah. you're having to fly straight on you know to an enemy and so I was kind of putting in my my wingman is kind of like fodder meat shield <laughs> <laughs> that's a good use that's a good use <laughs> looks, looks beautiful though I yeah really it's gorgeous it. so I, the first time I played it was in VR and oh, wow. oh. I, I said last time but I was just I said oh my god like six times before <laughs> I ever got into the game and oh, I mean the, I mean can I just say that font <laughs> <laughs> that is like the perfect yeah, I don't remember the <laughs> because it's interesting like you know the, the the story is actually really slight or very hard to kind of get a, a, a get uh, an appreciation for because I it's like a, a line of text mm. you know and to and there's some drum beats yeah there's some drum beats but but yeah you, it's all in for me the font because it's a bit duny <laughs> and a you know bit, what it yeah, reminds me of is yeah. not directly but like uh, sort of stylistically is Law and Order, where like every <laughs> sort of act break has a dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've certainly you and I have been playing Overwatch as well, Alex. We have. have you played Overwatch, Tom? Uh, a little bit, but like I've, I've, I've never seen Overwatch. I hate people. And, uh, people <laughs> oh, yeah, in this game have been kind of dicks a lot, so I've just yeah, like, stopped playing. Yeah, they have. I haven't actually seen I'm that many. But I'm, I play mostly with well, you. Yeah, we we tend to um, play together wherever possible, and that's. It's still not, like, it's pretty rare that we're playing, like, all of us making up the whole team. Like, we always have some people on our team who aren't, um, people we know. Um, and I was hoping, so they recently introduced competitive mode, which I have not played and do not intend to ever play. <laughs> because that's, like, a perfect description of everything I don't want from Overwatch. <laughs> and I was really excited about it. Like, for, like, at first they announced it, I'm like, oh, I don't care about that. And then I realized, oh, wait, I don't care about that. 
and lots of people do and those people will go to that mode and never come back and I never want to see those people again <laughs> naturally <laughs> and so I was really excited people. like oh cool all the like the, the assholes who bitch about um, <laughs> other people's class choices are going to go after this other separate mode and I've never seen them again no that hasn't happened they're all still there they're all still in quick play I don't know I guess they play both or maybe they uh, those people got too frustrated with people's class choices in competitive mode and decided never play it again but they're all still there in quick play it's <laughs> It's quite nice when you are with like a bunch of friends and in that situation, even if you lost and even if the other people in your team are like bitching about like, oh, someone needs to go support, but they're not going to support themselves. Um, that is mitigated greatly by the fact that you're all on voice comms and just laughing at this idiot. And I quite, quite enjoyed where we've, where we've had randoms kind of being random. Yeah, it's, it's generally tends to be more of a joke than a... Like, if you're on your own, even though you don't take that person seriously, even though you don't really, yeah. you don't respect their opinion, it still kind of stings. There's something just, it becomes a hostile environment. Yeah. Whereas whether you're with friends and you're talking about it, it's kind of just funny and you can brush it off a lot more easily. There was a person, uh, I wasn't really involved in this, but I still felt bad about it. <laughs> there was a person who was like, two of our group went Symmetra on this map because we knew, like, they'd tried it before and it works really well. Like, you know, each Symmetra can play six different turrets and so you can have 12 different turrets and if you put them in really sneaky positions it just destroys people um, and then some one of the people who wasn't in our group was like oh two Symmetras or well, only two Symmetras and then um, uh, we ignored him and then uh, we lost <laughs> well actually like we I think someone said something snarky to him and then he replied like uh, fine and I thought he was just saying like okay I'm done with this argument but then I looked at the roster and he'd gone Symmetra <laughs> he's like fine I'm all in let's all just fucking be Symmetra uh, and then we lost and then um, like we were saying in chat like oh man two Symmetras is too much we should have fewer Symmetras why didn't somebody say something about that <laughs> he, he did not get the sarcasm and was like come on how no. old are for fuck's sake <laughs> I just, that is like a little meta thing to the whole game, I think. I really, yeah, I, I wish there was, I don't know, I think that Blizzard have done the right thing in that there's competitive mode and there's quick play mode. And in theory, the quick play mode should be like the kind of sandbox where you just, uh, play whatever you like and have fun. And people don't treat it like that. People get annoyed about class choices. Uh, and I've also seen like, cause a quite popular post on Reddit saying like, rebelling against the people who tell them to calm down when they criticize other people's calm, class choices saying like oh sorry for actually like trying to play the game or I didn't realize you were only allowed to actually try and win in competitive mode uh, <laughs> but the thing that bothers me a bit about it is that the the game has its own uh, like pre-built statements about what it what it thinks a good team is and what you think you need and what it doesn't. Oh, what, in inevitably. The, in, in the, in the, yeah, so you, the little, you pick the classes and it tells you, oh, you need more tanks or, yeah. uh, or you don't have a sniper or whatever. And inevitably that system is not perfect. It's quite good. I think it's a, it's a good thing to have and, uh, they've done a decent job with it, but it's just taken as gospel by players. Yeah. And so if you have two of any class ever, someone will say, oh, you don't need two of them, but sometimes you do. If yeah. the enemy has like three bastions, maybe you need two Genjis. <laughs> maybe you need the six tracer, the six tracer <laughs> technique. Yep, I played a five tracer game with really, really one in like a minute and a half. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and there, I think there are loads of situations where like multiple ones of the same class is, um, viable. Uh, sometimes it's the best thing. Sometimes it's not the best thing, but it's still a fun thing to try and it's at least as good as a balanced team. Uh, sometimes even when you're not countering like a specific imbalance in the enemy team, having more than one sniper like, on defense can be fucking great. If you're on like a couple of good snipers on, on defense can be absolutely devastating. And having more than one support can be great. And having like, you know, two Reinhardts defending yeah. a bastion is it's pretty It's about strong. reaction and it's about sort but of they, making because, interesting plays. Because the game has just sort of created this gospel of what's right and what's wrong. Mm people back it up as well they just they've, they've assumed that what Blizzard say must be correct and then if you do that thing they, they'll criticize you for it which kind of sucks but I, I have found that like lately um, I don't have that many games that are actually frustrating like TF2 I was I played it loads and I played it with friends a lot but we didn't really do voice comms that much we play in the office sometimes but 90% um, uh, of my time in TF2 is playing without using a microphone uh, to talk to anyone um, and that was, you know, every multiplayer game was like, 
good 50% of the time. <laughs> and it's what the other 50% is like when you're losing. And I found with Overwatch, I'm having more and more games where, yeah, we lost, but actually it was kind of fun anyway, or it didn't feel totally unwinnable. Or Yeah, they, they often, matches often go, like, because of the overtime system where... Where you're often, you know, I, I get the feeling that where you're sort of capturing, cap, you know, capturing the zone, the counter can often like suspiciously go up fast when you're, you know, one team is on sort of well, 80. Apparently it's, um, completely broken for competitive play because the way it works is something like if, if it's in overtime and then someone from the other team gets on the cap, it goes back up to 100% or something or 99 or whatever. Like okay. instead of, uh, instead of, um, slowly adjusting to that change, it instantly adjusts to that change. Oh, and it means in competitive play, um, what really matters is just touching the cap every now and then. As long as you have someone touching the cap every now and then, you can't lose. Yeah. And so the team composition is like two Lucios, two Tracers, two <laughs> Winstons. Uh, Tracers because they can get to the front line fastest, Lucios because they can speed everyone else up, and um, Winstons, I guess, because they can also get to the front line really quickly fast, and also yeah. like t- be tanky. Um, and then Tracers getting on and off the cap, like no one can really stop them doing that. You can kill the tracer eventually, but you know, if there's two of them and there's the other classes running around, they'll always just get to the cap and that just keeps resetting the overtime counter and keeps resetting it and then no one can win. <laughs> it's really strange. So I don't know that much about how competitive play works, but there's so many complaints about, um, uh, kind of close games, like games where, um, it goes into sudden death. Uh, and that's like if you have, so on a single capture point map, uh, it, you know, someone has to win eventually, but it has that overtime system and that's kind of broken in that way. Uh, on an attack defend map, um, I think that overtime system is not a problem, but it's very possible for, uh, one team to win on attack and then to lose on defend. And so both the attacking teams have won mm. and it's basically a draw. Um, and then it goes into sudden death and that sudden death can be any map. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's the same map you've already played on, which means that it's not necessarily a, a capture point map. It can be, or not necessarily a king of the hill map. It can be a attack defend map, and it's random who attacks and who defends. And opinions, like when it first came out, everyone was like, "Ah, oh, this is such fucking bullshit!" Because whoever's on defense can't possibly win. Because oh, sorry, whoever's on attack can't possibly win. Because two minutes is not enough time to attack. It can't be done, uh, and it's bullshit. So whoever win- loses the coitus loses the game, and all our rankings are affected and everything. Um, and now. The complaint is exactly the same, except everyone says that, oh, it's completely impossible to defend that. Attackers will always win. I <laughs> think so, Blizzard will know all the statistics. Yeah, I mean, I suspect the players are right that this... I mean, doing it on an asymmetrical map is obviously just flawed. Like, yeah, the, yeah, true. The whole problem is that... But I, I find it so weird that they're not more willing to just call a win a win. Like, if two teams both won on attack, the one who won fastest on attack is better. <laughs> that's a better win like if you or or you or you actually have draws in the game because it's it, like despite competitive mode it's still not really a game that's really a competitive like yeah competitive yeah yeah, yeah so are you saying like they should just call it a draw yeah, yeah. just go for draws I mean I know that I can appreciate I mean, I would, a lot of people I make find it like, that unsatisfying I would pick a difference in time that you're that is big enough that you could say that was yeah. a full win like if someone wins five minutes faster than the other team that's that's probably a, as good as actually beating the other team and then from that to zero difference you'd scale down what the win is so whatever the points they get for the win you kind of just multiply it the trouble right. is then you're just advising people to say oh we're taking too long to do this let's just give up for the rest of the round if they already <laughs> know you know at what speed well they still don't know if the other person's going to win I suppose if the the second team who are attacking yeah, so know what time the original people took and then they know, but then they'll yeah. still but be working to minimise win. their loss percentage if yeah. it is proportional they'd still want to mm. be as close as they or could or do you just do a best of three oh, yeah. what I'm talking about they still anyway that's probably not worth thinking about that much because <laughs> never going to play it <laughs> It's interesting though, because they obviously have wanted this game to be both casual and competitive and, um, it's launch was so positive, like the reaction was just so unanimously, um, positive and even, like people had class complaints, but they also had like total faith in Blizzard to fix everything and, uh, I've seen multiple people like come out, uh, post on Reddit and stuff, uh, coming out and just saying like Jeff Kaplan is brilliant and it's so nice to see him like, um, responding to all our complaints and really feels like he's in tune. And then this competitive thing is the first thing where like people are, uh, because they've said they're not going to change it this season, how it works. Mm. And so they're kind of saying like, all these problems you have, they're just going to be problems for a while. Mm. And now people are kind of losing faith. 
It's hard. I mean, it only it's only been out for a month. Yeah, I think I probably been that, premature to lose more me. than a month. Yeah. Hmm. Should we do questions? Let's do questions. Yes. Um, Jon Torkelson uh, says, I have a few questions and observations that I'd like to hear your views on. He gives three, but we're only going to answer one because we don't have time for everything. Um, I've heard that some of you like sword fighting. Here is my problem with sword fighting in games. The swords, or maces or whatever, always pass through enemies, at least unless blocked. And that is really not realistic, if you think about it. Do we just accept this because we've already learned to accept clipping in video game graphics? Is there a better way to represent sword fighting that would actually work in game? Um, I kind of agree with this. I, like, it, it's certainly what bothers me about a lot of like, I, it tends to be more in console games than PC games because there are a lot of console games that are kind of like big slashy, slashy games. Slashy yeah, like games. Bayonetta and um, God of War. That genre. I don't know about Bayonetta itself, but um, uh, I often see like. You know, a trailer for a big new game that everyone's excited about that I've never heard of, and I look at it and I realize, oh, it's a console only series where the main character swishes a big sword or weapon in a big arc that leaves like a big white trail and it hits like 19 enemies at once, but there's no sense that it really hit them in any real sense. Mm. Um, so yeah, I kind of agree with that. Obviously, like actually simulating the full physics of how a blade hits a body and, you know, doing true, I don't know, animated physics rag dolly like reaction to that would be difficult there is i mean there have been like tech demos where i remember there's one like the g-man's face and wherever you click it rips apart his face <laughs> and his face like, goes into a horrible <laughs> gibbering wreck uh, around it and it's like well, okay we don't have that in games um soldier of fortune had like pretty yeah, precise deformation of, of faces and stuff you'd need something like that i guess I think you've got the probably... lightsaber problem, like where mm. lightsabers are kind of meant to cut through anything. Yeah, and... so lightsabers are the one where, like, I feel like making a lightsaber game is easier than making a true sword fighting game because lightsabers are meant to go through everything, <laughs> and all you have to do, with, all you have to deal with, is how that thing falls apart or whatever. Whereas swords should be stopped at some point. Like, if you hit an armored person with a sword, maybe you cut through the armor, or maybe you cut through some of his flesh but it doesn't go all the way through whereas a lightsaber you can just say like well it passes through anything that isn't a lightsaber um, and yeah I think the physics of it are too difficult and then also probably the game mechanics of it are not worth it because if every sword blow that hits like cuts off a limb or completely cripples that limb <laughs> you basically won the fight at that point <laughs> and it doesn't, the rest of the fight On doesn't your really first matter slash. and so yeah it's really just like first strike wins and that's, I think that's generally true of like bullets as well. You know, you get shot in games a lot and the, your reaction to getting yeah, shot is nothing off. like a real person's reaction to getting shot. A real person's reaction to getting shot is they fucking stop fighting. <laughs> I think like as long as there's reaction, like I think that, that Dark Souls uh, and Bloodborne really get a sense of sharp things being swung because because the reaction of the thing that you're hitting is there's a real kind of lurch back and they're often show wounds as well like slashes across them sound design of Bloodborne as well yeah. uh, and those games where there's mm. kind of real squelching kind of yeah uh, spray sound. of blood yeah um, I guess in a sense it's actually like closer to my heart than I realise because I I um, <laughs> spray, now we're talking about sprays of blood I love blades and killing people um, but also like you know this is a, a thing where I'm never going to make a game where you swipe a melee weapon at someone and it goes straight through them and they lose 10 hit points, right? I've always tried to avoid hit points anyway. Mm -hmm. And Heat Signature is a game where it does have melee weapons. It already has like wrenches and stuff in it, but we're going to do swords and we're going to do other uh, different types of melee weapons. And the way we get around this is that every single melee hit always kills somebody. <laughs> like they don't survive it. So we don't have to model exactly what happens to them. It's just they're dead. So uh, uh, you kind of have to have a. The thing about this swipey through people thing is that you, when you press a button to attack, there has to be an element of guaranteed damage to that for a combat system often to be very satisfying. Where, mm -hmm. Whereas um, with actually swinging a heavy thing at a fleshy lump, like there's all sorts of intermediate outcomes that could happen. Like yeah. you clipping their arms or kind of slamming into the, a hip or something, or into a piece of armour or not. And that, I think, would prove deeply unsatisfying as an actual combat mechanic. We need the gang beasts of sword fighting. <laughs> so do you, do you remember... So so this brings to mind uh, Mode 7 games. Yeah. First game, which was called Deliverance. No, yeah, yeah, Deliverance, yeah, Determinants, yeah. <laughs> which you played way, way, way back. Yeah. How, that was a sword fighting game. 
It was a sort of thing where you were both also flying, so you were like, I don't know what the story was exactly, but you you were both just literally like floating in the air, and you would swoop towards each other and swing the sword. I think with the mouse. I think it was like a sort of precision. Obviously, one of those kind of uh, right. white so. sweeping. The I couldn't mouse. swear to it. It was I was really new at PC Gamer, and they came to the office and showed us this, and I didn't know who they were at all. Um, and I mean. I guess there was nothing to know. <laughs> there were the people who made the determinants. So I didn't know what determinants was. Um, and I quite liked it. I thought it was kind of cool. I, I liked the idea of like, it, I don't think it was super big on like sword fighting. I think you get it in like a clash where you had to sort of, you know, win the struggle or whatever. But it wasn't about the sort of intricacy of fencing because you were flying. So the distance involved were enormous. And it was like, just how do you lunge and who's lunging at who and that kind of stuff. Um, I thought it was quite cool. But they um, have consistently referred to it in subsequent talks and stuff as a total failure. <laughs> it's just kind of written it off. But then, yeah. That, I mean, compared to Frozen Synapse, it's, it's nothing like as good as that. Yeah. And it, it also brings to mind um, uh, Neil Stevenson's game Clang, mm. which was meant to be very much like it was. I remember the Kickstarter campaign was all about his frustration with games that depicted swords and them not being, you know, realised in any realistic way. And now that's cancelled. And that went got canned, yeah. yeah. So Shout out to uh, Silver, which also had the kind of click-drag mouse oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. sword fighting thing, but in a stodgy RPG. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Die by the Sword is the one that, you know, the oldest one of mouse-driven swords swinging. But even Was that- it though? Because um, uh, uh, Ultimate Underworld had a mouse draggy uh, you didn't before. drag you just sort of clicked on the area of the screen that roughly corresponded oh, to you, had to, you had to sweep it you had to did you? <laughs> maybe that. I did <laughs> maybe I got very excited um, Dive Sword was like very analogue it was kind of like you know every twitch of your mouse actually physically moved your sword oh, in, the, yeah. in the space and whether how much damage you did was actually determined by the physics simulation of like how hard did this object hit that object was it satisfying Tom no <laughs> <laughs> I mean it kind of was I, I played it a lot and I liked it a lot but it was you couldn't even once quite practiced with it I couldn't really show you a clip of 30 seconds of me playing it that didn't involve some extreme awkwardness or weirdness and your sword passing through people because like the, the point of that if you can fully control the position of your sword, then that also means that when you fail to do a really decisive strike, you've done a kind of like feeble strike on them and you've just kind of waved your sword at them. But they can't actually stop the sword going through the body, I don't think, because then your mouse would be out of sync with it, I guess. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting because we're going to have the same problem with VR. Like, VR will be capable of doing incredible things with close combat mm. except ever stopping your blows <laughs> I had <laughs> this, never uh, have it yeah I, I tried a, a demo where there was first person combat and you were fighting a giant skeleton and uh, he had his shield up and there was a, the great moment of like stabbing over his shield like reaching oh, over yeah. and actually going nice. down and it kind of registered in that way oh, wow. but it didn't feel like I was, like you say uh, there's no resistance however mm. it did feel like I was brutally killing a thing <laughs> <laughs> so on that level it was really quite successful <laughs> the worst of all worlds really <laughs> yeah <laughs> not mechanically convincing but still deeply disturbing <laughs> uh, Rob Young writes Dear Kale and Quinoa I recently wandered through impossibly elaborately set quasi-interactive radio play up everybody has gone to the rapture and left my mind meandering there for quite a while, as I believe was probably the intent. Loving the score of then Chinese Room co-director Jessica Curry so much, I investigated what she is up to at the moment and discovered that she has left the company in her public farewell letter revealing that she had been diagnosed with some manner of chronic degenerative disease. I'm sure it's no great spoilers that a story called Everyone's Gone to the Rapture has some elements that tie in very heavily to the personal experience of chronic disease, and this discovery thoroughly changed the depth of my reading of the game, allowing the enormously powerful component of empathy to come through, until I realised that I had no idea whether or not Curry had actually been diagnosed at the time of making the game. Eventually, I decided that it didn't matter, that my empathy with the characters in the story had been improved regardless of whether or not they were intended as a conduit for personal expression of shared emotions. So I guess my question's are these. Do you allow yourselves to see the creator in the work? Have you been fooled by this? Have there been any instances where learning more about the creator of the game has changed your feeling about the game itself? Is Phil Fish okay? <laughs> Ta very much for reading, Derek. Wait, um, it's signed Derek, but it says Rob Young at the top. Okay, it's Derek. <laughs> Forget Rob Young. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's quite an interesting point. Like, I don't think you're ever fooled by 
like a context of a game, like because your reading of any game or book or film, or whatever is whatever is valid, whatever you think, mm. you know, it might be wrong or or not shared more specifically with by other people, including the creators, but it doesn't make it that you've been fooled. Yeah, you listen to that U2 album uh, and you think, <laughs> oh, that made me feel this way about this thing. Bono isn't coming into your house to go, that's wrong. He, that's might, he might do. Illegitimate. He might do. <laughs> 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 wouldn't put it past him, frankly. <laughs> um, but no, they're quite right. It's interesting, uh, have you ever learned something about a creator that has tainted the works that have, uh, that you've enjoyed or kind of affected the way you've mm. I, so, about things? I, the witness springs to mind in that it's not that... We love Jay Blown. Yeah. <laughs> I do like, I, I do like Blown, him. That's a, and I like the game. Great pop star name, isn't it? But he's just said so much <laughs> about his philosophy of, of game making <laughs> that, that the witness fails at that I think I probably am harsher on the witness for it. Like, if it was someone who'd never said anything about game design and they made that game, I'd be like, oh yeah, it's pretty good. Like, uh, I, I like a decent percentage of the puzzles. The, some of them are really good. Uh, some of the sort of sequences are really brilliant at teaching you things, but there's also a lot of dross in there. There's a lot of time wasting. There's a lot of repetition. And, you know, that's the thing I'm used to in games. But because John Blow has been so vocal and so specific, like, <laughs> never waste the player's time, never disrespect, never ask them to repeat themselves, never ask them to, like, mm. do this. I'm, I was just kind of bewildered by how much of that there was in the <laughs> So actually, I, that's an excellent choice because I, I literally said on the podcast when we were talking about this that my experience of the game would have been improved by not following John Blow on Twitter. <laughs> and for slightly different reasons, actually. I think it's because it, um, I expected a greater level of uh, depth or complexity to the themes of the game. Yeah. And, and there is some of that, but a lot of it is kind of fluff. Mm, uh, I think it's a game as better the less you know about uh, it quite right. <laughs> like death and that goes right down to where it comes from absolutely yeah. absolutely um yep yeah because yeah, like a, a sort of uh, uh, a friend of ours who i had no idea they had a playstation you know and and like much less had bought the witness mm. um and she she played it with her son who goes to the same school as my my son and and she was talking to me in the playground and like, oh, I've been playing it. Yeah, I don't know what it's called. Can't remember. Really colourful, full of puzzles. And <laughs> could it be the witness? <laughs> and she said, yeah, we absolutely love it. Yeah. And like, oh, that's cool. And for them, all these philosophies are completely irrelevant. Yeah, They're just yeah. purely experience, experiencing the game and like, and having a word of the time. Yeah. It's so good. It, yeah. It's only weird have had that experience and yeah. not been so. There's also like the way it's presented really in the game is very like a theme park and, and like a sort of, a destination that you just kind of go and you wander around and you do some stuff if you can do that stuff and you encounter a lot of stuff you can't do and I wonder if I was if I would have been more receptive to that if I hadn't been thinking of it mm. as this kind of I assume it's going to be a refined selection of perfect puzzles from the mastermind Jonathan Blow who you know not even just even if I had never followed him on Twitter just from playing Braid Braid was a, yeah. a really brilliant showcase of like every puzzle is its own unique thing and every puzzle is saying something and some of them I don't like but uh, only a couple and even the ones I don't like the things the reason I don't like them is because they're different to the puzzles I did like they, they've changed something and John Blow likes to explore a puzzle space fully and um, I don't think that always works out but at least they're all different in their own way whereas The Witness I just felt loads of them were just the same as the last eight had done um, but yeah if, you, if I was just I had no idea who made it and I just stumbled across this thing and just found like, oh, there's so many cool puzzles in this mm. thing. And the fact that there were a bunch that aren't that cool wouldn't have bothered me, I don't think, that much. It's interesting that um, the influence of a, a game on its on the games that the, the developers go on to make. I, I felt this with the creators of World of Goo. After playing World of Goo and just having such a magical experience mm. from this unheard of developer, um, then their subsequent stuff was a disappointment <laughs> because I, it didn't recapture the same sense of magic, even though I mean, had its own maybe all us developers just change our names right because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I'm probably going to hit this with, with Heat Signature because it's I, I don't really know for sure but um, it's not going to be a single linear narrative thing that you play through in three hours for sure um, and Gunpoint was and so a bunch of people who really like Gunpoint and then played this thing only because they like Gunpoint might have that complaint and it, yeah if, you, if I was completely starting from like anonymity I wouldn't feel obliged to put any story stuff in it, but I kind of do feel obliged to put some kind of story stuff in it if I can. Hmm. I guess the questioner is talking about I mean, positive. His, his example is is about 
a very personal thing he knows about one of the creators of the game mm. and how that influences it. And I can't think of anything like that. Um, Phil Fish is making Super Hypercube now, and yeah. uh, loads of people really like that. It, it sounds to me... So that's a PlayStation... Oh, is it only PlayStation yeah, 4? Yeah, I, it, it? I think it's PlayStation VR exclusive. Yeah. And it's a VR game where like, you have a weird shape in front of you, and... If you've ever seen that Japanese game show where like a wall comes towards the contestant and they have to make themselves into a certain shape to pass through the gap in the wall, mm. it's that, but you are uh, rotating a complex conglomerate of cubes uh, to try and match the 2D shape that's coming towards you. And it's in VR, so you... I think the shape in front of you kind of blocks your view and you have to kind of like peer around it to see what's yeah. going on. Uh, you everyone point. I know who's played it says it's great. Yeah, I've heard that too, yeah. Um, Jamie Elvin writes uh, quick two part question why don't you talk about console games and with the new more iterative console cycles of Scorpio and Neo is the distinction between PC and console still relevant and if so how long do you think it will remain so well we just did talk about some console games so <laughs> yeah, that's, we did. Uh, all the time. <laughs> yeah. he kind of he, he elaborates a bit on these questions to say um it's not uncommon for one of you to enthusiastically start talking about a console game, then quickly back out of the conversation upon realizing it's not a PC game. Um, are there? I know the pod was born out of PC gamer, but are there any other reasons that you remain focused on the PC platform? Um, I think, uh, I mean, hey, it's like the main platform of interest for all of us. Um, but also, one of the reasons it seemed worth doing was that there just aren't that many PC gaming podcasts out there. There are millions of generic. Uh, oh, sorry, general game no, podcast. Don't, don't be rude, Tom. <laughs> Generic is <and> something. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting, like, you know, the two of the other podcasts that I recommended in the last time we were asked for podcast recommendations are Idle Thumbs and Video Games Hot Dog, yeah. both of which do cover multiple platforms and both of which are anyway PC focused. Mm. Both of them just happen to have a bunch of people who are really interested in the PC, um, stuff. And on, in Idle Thumbs case, they veer into console stuff a lot. And uh, in Video Games Hot Dogs case, they actually veer into mobile a lot more than they veer into yeah. console. Um, but for me, it's like uh, making the podcast platform specific is kind of a um, reassurance for the listeners. Like if you don't have a particular console, like if you, if you just don't have, uh, you know, um, a console that can play Bloodborne or whatever, and you're listening to a podcast where they talk about Bloodborne a lot, then that whole section is going to be maybe interesting to some extent, but past a certain point, you're like, okay, I get it. It sounds cool. <laughs> and I can't play it. And so, like, just if you have a PC, then you can probably play almost everything we ever talk about here. If you've listened to the podcast for any length, you know that we we all play games on consoles as well and love a lot of games on consoles. Mm. Some brilliant stuff out there. Um, and we've always kind of meant to pop out little specials that maybe talk about yeah. console games independently. We've just literally just not found the time to do it. Um but I mean, like we were, went mad for Destiny and Bloodborne last year, and Bloodborne especially is, still feels like we should do one. But uh, yeah, we'll definitely bear that in mind for future. If people want us to want to hear our opinions on console games, we we'll kind of pop it out as a side thing from the podcast. But we'll always keep a great crowbar PC focus thing. Yeah. Um, so the question was: that, Do we think the distinction of PC and consoles is still relevant, given that? consoles are now doing incremental upgrades i think politically is incredible more relevant than ever <laughs> <laughs> the reason being that um if there's anything about pc it's the fact that it's an entirely open platform and right now arguably those that distinction is being challenged yes by uh, microsoft's um vision of the kind of the the, the windows platform that spans both the, the xbox and PC, but ultimately, you don't have to have Windows on your machine. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you could go and install Linux. You could look at other alternatives. And those alternatives will always and always exist on PC, I think. No matter what Microsoft does, there will always be these kind of, <laughs> I don't know, rogue OSs that will <laughs> exist and kind of allow people to experience yeah. games on the PC. But there's always that danger that you won't get to play Far Cry. Sure, or yeah. That. And, um, you know... That's, I mean, the there are already there are already some games that have been announced that are Windows 10 exclusive, right? And, yeah. And are well, they I'll Windows see, Store exclusive as well? There are some, like Gears of War will be. Right. I'd expect almost all of them to be sure. I, I um, saw... You know, I remember reading an article... Sea of Thieves. With, and I really like the look of Sea of Thieves. Yeah, it looks really fun. I'm sure Phil Spencer said something about, like, uh, we will be releasing these on Steam as well, or other platforms as well. Yeah, they have said that. Like, they... When he spoke to us, he was quite open about the fact that 
Um, they just there are so many sales on PC on Steam, sorry, compared to other yeah. stores that it's almost kind of just it's suicide financial yeah. madness <laughs> not to put your games on there in some yeah. some way. But then Quantum Break came out and that was a Windows Store and it's, it's yeah. Windows. So I we, we don't know yet precisely what how they're going to approach that and what maybe games they think that their big games will actually go over to Steam. The stuff they don't expect to do so well. Quantum Break will be store exclusive. Who knows? I like those other platforms updating themselves to me does not reduce the barrier between mm. them and PC it's mm. the barrier is still the same it's still you can't play those games if you have a PC and you can't play I, PC I, games if you have that thing. I think it's encouraging I, I think there's still mm. a massive separation between the two but it means that the technological baseline at which people will be mm. developing games over the next decade will be constantly increasing yeah. so we, we're going to see better and better looking games and the games that could do more as a result of this we won't be tied into a decade long uh, te- technological standard that often holds back what developers can do, as we saw in the last generation. But the open worlds we've seen since the generational shift, in terms of like The Witcher 3 and like the remaster GTA 5, are just extraordinary. And, you know, as long as technology progresses, then we can expect to see more of that. And also given that there'll be, you know, they're, they're both Xbox One and PlayStation 4 are so similar, like architecturally so similar to a PC, mm. that it means that PC can expect to get those games, you know, with a degree of quality and, you know, stability and, and, stability and whatever else, it's, you know, it's easier for them to be converted. Yeah. It's a, or for it to be developed on PC and then put over. Yeah. It's encouraging, I think. Yeah. Uh, Carlos Sol Rojo Salazar. <laughs> Definitely didn't get all of that. I think, uh, didn't, wasn't that an evil character in something <laughs> oh uh, 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 Resident Evil 4 oh really <laughs> that's a console game we don't talk about that <laughs> God, brilliant bad guys in Resident Evil 4 actually no that's totally on PC isn't it <laughs> it is um, he writes uh, dear podcat in a previously alive and subsequently defunct although later revived podcast what the PC gamer podcast <laughs> it's not Voldemort it's not the PC gamer podcast <laughs> you guys have had dedicated episodes for spoilers in this new podcast, you barely talk about spoilers, and I think this is due to this fact. Um, some discussions of value regarding the quality of storylines has been lost. Have you ever considered making episodes where you talk about spoilers again, making a spoiler sections in episodes? I think the latter option is good if what you don't want is having an episode not everyone can listen to. Having a 20-minute section listeners who don't want to hear spoilers can easily skip would not be intru- too intrusive, I think. Cheers from Mexico. Um... I think having a 20-minute section in the middle of a podcast that had spoilers in would be a pain in the ass for a lot of people because if you're, like, cycling and you're listening to this thing and then the spoiler section comes up, it's like, oh, God, I've got to come (laughs) off the road to avoid spoilers for this thing. Um, Maybe having it at the end... I think we'd we'd pop it out into a different thing, I think. Yeah. I mean, just have a 20-minute or 30-minute, like, extra bonus pod. Our failing really is is not that we haven't thought about this. We've... for many different games in the last few years we have said oh we should totally do a dedicated podcast for that or we should totally do a dedicated spoiler podcast for that uh, and then we don't go around to it because we or do this one night a week and it's pretty rare for us all to have like another night a week hmm. um, but I think yeah I think we should probably think about is just doing like the spoiler podcast in the same night and just doing like a, a general podcast then doing a spoiler podcast the same yeah. way yeah and uh, like, uh, to be honest if you're, if you're listening and you like that idea then let us know because we have no idea how many people would mm. um, really b- enjoy that stuff so uh, it's really useful for us to hear feedback on ideas like that yep it's quite tricky because there's a like it's rare for there to be this one game that we all have played that we all want to talk about so yeah, it doesn't but, have to be everyone but. I mean Chris and I could have talked about like Destiny from forever <laughs> if we were to, like I think we could generate enough time. yeah this ties straight back into the console question of like anything where only a certain percentage of people will be interested in it might as well be a separate pod yeah sure um Cone Brummels writes sorry for your name uh for my pronunciation of your name good day weighted companion cubes and zero point energy field manipulators when the portal trailer Okay, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. When the portal trailer, I was very excited for it to come out. <laughs> Perhaps when I saw the portal trailer, it was very excited to come out. I was very happy when it did and loved um, loved it, but was somewhat disappointed when it did not have the stay in the air a long time puzzles. Are there any games you loved that were disappointed when you came out? 
Um, I think he was referring to like there were some puzzles in the original trailer that were just like nuts. Um, the, where I don't know if like the puzzles themselves weren't in the game or if it just wasn't necessary to do that solution. But there was a puzzle in the original portal trailer that was so cool. Um, I analyzed it, uh, until I totally understood what was happening. And then when I totally understood what was happening, I realized it doesn't make sense. Like the solution that they do is not necessary. And it's the thing where, um, the player like fires themselves across a chasm and then shoots a portal below them and they drop down into that portal. And as they're dropping down, they put their exit portal next to it so that they drop back out of that mm-hmm. same floor going upwards and then when they're going upwards they face backwards and plant a new portal and then when they fall back into the portal they just came out of they that then causes them to be launched across the room and when you look at the puzzle setup you can see that they didn't need to do that there was a way simpler way to do it um and but i was so impressed that was the thing i loved about that trailer and uh was so excited about it that i made my own portal level where you do have to do that (laughs) and it was going to be i was going to make a whole episode of portal and um have my own storyline for it and stuff but i only ever got around to making that one puzzle and it was just like this certain barrier that comes down from the ceiling that means that the only way to get past it is to shoot this portal into it then drop down it became so contrived (laughs) yeah it was kind of ridiculous it it did kind of work though i sent it to some people and they they played it and they got it and it panned out my name for that that chapter was judos because glados stands for what is it something G life form and operate and disc operating system is it general life form or I can't remember but a judos was just a disc operating system <laughs> um where are we now okay Diffraction Man writes we always laugh at game villains having no plan other than to break everything and then run away are there any game stories that seem stupid at the time, but given recent events, seem like something that people would do? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Crusader Kings too, and anything to do with Brexit. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's all, it's all coming back, isn't it? It's, it's great the actual factions dividing, eating <laughs> each other, and you know, <laughs> it's great assassinations uh, and all the good, all the good shit, all the good you know? shit. <laughs> uh, it seems pretty good to me that all the villains resigned after the, doing their thing like <laughs> it's better than them sticking around like okay yeah you can also criticize them for cowardice but like thank god they didn't stick around and fl- see it through like thank god it's going to be chaos rather than actual malice <laughs> imagine if Sauron have fucked off that video that three four <laughs> exactly. three it's like oh well I've done my bit it's fine it's going to retire now <laughs> uh, uh, follow up question because the machine spirit of this iPod is sending things before I'm done with them I was hearing Tom Senior talk about the Dawn of War. Oh, sorry, talk about Dawn of War recently, and how Warhammer is about huge battles. I think maybe that's true for the tabletop, but Dawn of War Two felt like playing a story from the 40k books. I was always impressed by the mechanics, uh, but I loved how each piece of the loop had a story to it, more than I'd seen in, other, in any other game, and how there would be remarkably deep conversations between you and your squad members between missions. It was an RTS that did RPG things better than a lot of RPGs. So what other games have excelled in areas you didn't expect them to? Dawn of War 2 Retribution felt broken mechanically in ways that suited the lore and were fun. Uh, you could buy units and got refunded the cost when they died. But the Orc War Boss could replenish units for free, by shouting loudly of course, so you could generate a massive army by constantly sending units to their deaths. It felt like cheating the game in a way that, that you suspect was intended. Have there been any other games where you've exploited the mechanics of in a way that enhanced rather than ruined the experience? Hope you're having a lovely day. Regards, Peter. I think the games that have excelled in the areas you didn't expect them to, I don't know if we have answers to that, but I enjoyed his story about that. Yeah. <laughs> and no, then, I think there is something that is a game that does strike me, um, Disgaea, which is is on PC now. Um, but like, it's a game that is all about gaming. It's like, so it's the game. games that you've exploited the mechanics of in a way that enhance rather than ruin the experience. Exactly. Yeah. So this is a game in which you, it's all about leveling and leveling and leveling and you can level yourself and you can level your weapons and you can level everything in it. And the numbers of damage that you cause, uh, go up, uh, 
exponentially so you get sort of vast numbers coming out <laughs> it's basically it's a number of it's a game about increasing the, the numbers and it's all about breaking it in order to do that in order to level up uh weapons for instance you go inside them and then play levels inside the weapon and there's the further you get in <laughs> okay. these levels and these levels are infinite they go on for as long as you <laughs> wow and the further you get the more powerful the weapon becomes play this. and it's insanely deep and incredibly long and mm. you know and it's about basically breaking it and you can get these incredibly sort of virtuous circles of 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 abilities playing off each other and you know <laughs> with these kind of light shows of of stuff happening and numbers and this is on PC now it is on PC yeah because it was a PlayStation 2 originally I think but it's, um, yeah it's on PC now I think the conversion was a little bit janky but mm. it's totally worth it yeah I would say um, <clears throat> mostly Final Fantasy 7 I think the favourite RPGs I've ever played have offered the truly faithful a way to break the game yeah. and that, that's your was reward it night, what was it like the night there was a Knights of the Round one wasn't there where you could kind of uh, repeat chain it chain well there's, there's the, the mime material and, uh, there's the magic spell mime and actually Knights of the Round wasn't the most efficient way to exploit this oh uh, really so Knights of the Round is the, this inc- extraordinary summon and it takes like it's like nine minutes <laughs> to unfold um, so you have to watch the, 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 the enemy it's like you could do it on a tiny grasshopper if you want to, and then these knights kind of emerge out of the ether and slice it into pieces, and all the knights of the round table come and kill it uh, and deal like nine 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 damage, uh, and then you have the person next to them who just casts mime, and they don't have to have that summon; they just repeat the summon again. <laughs> so it's another nine minutes of footage. Uh, so it's going to take you like you know twenty five minutes to kill this grasshopper, <laughs> whereas the the savvy Final Fantasy VII player will know that quad slash and mime is by far the best uh, uh, thing because all quad slashes is they go up and punch them four times for nine 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 damage each punch. What? And so you're dealing. Look at that damage output. It's much better. It's much better. I mean, you have to do a fuckload of stuff to get that. But um, I, that was one of the great joys I took from that game is like understanding the system and then exploiting it in that way and. I, I, I wish more RPGs would offer people ways to break the game uh, through devotion. Yeah. <laughs> the power of devotion. Um, F- Zed Fang writes, what is your favourite character arc in a game? My pick would probably be Morden in Mass Effect with his struggle regarding the Jenna page. It's a, it's a great call. Morden's story is was the one that really got me in the Mass Effect series. Mm. Um, I, I, by the end I didn't really care about Shepard I cared about Shepard but I didn't really care about the, the <laughs> overarching kind of Reaper threat stuff but Mordin was was the one yeah there was um, I'm playing The Witcher as I said before but um, Buddy Baron obviously the kind of the high point <clears throat> low point high point <laughs> of um, yeah. Witcher 3 uh, where he takes you on an arc um of kind of well depending on which which way you play it but redemption or or further misery depending um and like that game is all about taking you in directions that you didn't expect so I'm playing Blood and Wine at the moment expansion that came out recently and um like the main story in that is just so much fun like it's just going off in all sorts of directions and it is one where characters you meet you just don't know you really don't know what they're going to do, what they're going to come. Well, I like the fact that your character, like Geralt, is very steady within it all. You know, yeah, he's a straight man to everything that happens, yeah. isn't he? Which is perfect. Yeah. it's a, a, What I think is great about Blood and Wine in particular is that it's allowed to be a shorter story than the main quest in The Witcher 3. So The, the Witcher 3 has it has this pressure to be a, you know, a world-ending threat and it has the pressure to be a 40-hour mm. story, whereas Blood and Wine, they, they can do like a, a 10 to 12-hour thing and that's just a far more healthy place for a story to develop and yeah. uh, a better length for uh, character arcs to, to, to happen in. Yeah, because in the main story, what you got was kind of these sort of chunks of stories, yes. kind of, and it did feel, oh, we're in the Bloody Baron bit. Yeah, and then, like, right. that will now end, and now we'll go into another chunk, mm. like, chapters, which did feel a little bit kind of, um, for all the individual richness and sort of uh, gratification, they did feel a little bit um, artificial. Mm. Yeah, for sure. What I enjoy about um, the Bloody Baron and a lot of the Witch 3 characters that you spend a lot of time with is that it's not almost not the arc of 
there is an arc to the character that you're you've encountered, but it's all, there's almost most of it is about discovering them layer by layer, and yeah. what you initially think he is it isn't what you think he is. Then you judge him in a certain way, and then things happen to make your judgment a different way, and it becomes synthetic again. That would be meaningless if you haven't done it, so I apologise for <laughs> thirty <laughs> seconds. Um, but no, the Witch story is brilliant. Just amazing quest writing. I have not played the Witch. Oh, I haven't played the Billy Baron quest in the Witch Three, but I've heard so much about it from so many different sources at this <laughs> there's point, no need to play it anymore <laughs> uh, uh, yeah I mean I, this is not to um, uh, I'm not being victimised by aggressive uh, spoilers or anything I, I read a bunch of articles that said this spoils this quest do not read this right. and I was like oh, I'm, I'm probably not going that far I just want to find out what it's about I think the, if you've missed out on the Witcher phenomenon or you feel like um, you don't have enough time to play the Witcher 3 I'd recommend waiting and picking up The Witch 3 and Blood and Wine in a sale. And what you can do with Blood and Wine is just create a brand new Geralt, a new character yes. from scratch. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. And you can go in and it, it, like there, are, there will be some major quest spoilers, but nothing too hideous. And you'll get that contained adventure in this contained place. And I think that's that's a great way to play The Witch 3. There's barely any callbacks to the main... No, they're very careful about it. Yeah. They're, they're very careful not to actually spoil what happens. Because they, they can't guarantee where, whether you've played it or not. Yeah. Because I... I in general, my the reason I haven't got super into the Witcher series is that I much prefer RPGs where I can create my own character, or where my character is neutral enough that it doesn't really matter that I have to play as one person, hmm. and I can just kind of impose my own personality on it. Whereas Geralt, kind of in the main quest at least, has a pretty strong personality already, and you just you're this guy, and if you don't like that guy, then it's it's not. How can you not like Geralt? <laughs> Let me tell best. you the ways. <laughs> but, uh, it's interesting Geralt, though, to hear you guys refer to him as like a, the straight man in the blood and wine thing makes me more interested in that. I mean, he's the straight man throughout. Like he's he's kind of. My problem yeah, was like weird. I really hate characters yeah, who are weird. like yeah. who are glorified. I hate this even in TV as well as games, uh, where like the protagonist is just this kind of like ultimate hero god where every woman wants him and every man wants to be uh, him mm. and Geralt certainly has that in the uh, well, game well it's interesting because mm. like the, with the women that's true but everyone well, actually not hates, all of them. hates they, him yeah the um, women the, a lot of them kind of I mean I, I think there were lots that's of just... scenes in the main game where like okay these people hate me but then they get completely humiliated and destroyed <laughs> like it's just immediate and that's the same yeah. thing I don't like in TV like you know yeah sure I, I kind of got off house when like house was not only um, uh, adored and glorified by this set of people that then this small set of people who didn't like him got completely crushed and destroyed and humiliated for not liking him. You can't like her, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like her. Um, last question is from uh, Jamie O'Donnell. No, Jams at all. Jonathan Sutcliffe. <laughs> His Twitter name is Jams at all. A man of many aliases. <laughs> Uh, which one of you is leaving severed feet around Bath? <laughs> there are, there's been a second, a seven, second foot seven foot around foot near Bath. Bath. Did you read this? It was? One? Yes. No, oh, what? It's it's really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a sense, the other foot has dropped. <laughs> <laughs> my first question what was... What if it's two left feet? That's it. <laughs> that was my first question as well. <laughs> Surely I was like, not. is it Surely a complete set? Same yeah. Set. Uh, so yeah, there's um, there's a serial killer on loose, uh, loose in Bath, it seems. Oh, oh. Foot it, remover. Foot remover. <laughs> or, or a person who has removed their own feet. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an extraordinary... Uh, it uh, says something about... crime drama. <laughs> does this say something about us, or does it say something about Bath, that we're not scared, we're just <laughs> amused? <laughs> it's, it's the only thing that's happened in, like, it's ten the years. <laughs> so, uh, there was a... I listened to a good stuff you should know about uh, a particular... I think it was Vancouver or something, where... Um, this bay where severed feet kept on washing up in trainers oh all the time and they were like why is this happening and the local police were like don't worry about it it's just it's what happens <laughs> it's just like why but why would you get this many severed feet in this place <laughs> and um this turn it turned out that uh it turned out to be about the science of the way people disintegrate after drowning deaths and oh my God. what gets carried where and stuff like this. And so, yeah, go listen to that if you want some gruesome, that uh, fantastic. fascinating... So the feet were just kind of like rotting off. Well, presumably like in well, the trainer, actually, it protects it from getting... Well, quite right, that, exactly right. Oh yeah, my it was, God. It was the, the ankle would rot and the trainers would go off and, and, and certain slipstreams would carry into certain areas. <laughs> Um, fascinating. Really and well, Vancouver was... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so. Um, I mean, obviously, Bath... 
uh, not a sea facing uh, <laughs> car, it's, it's, it's something carried by the wind so uh, there's a far more sinister plot of foot. or as people have speculated on the first foot that it was um, like a drunk med student who was having a laugh or something like that who yeah. found the way into the morgue and decided to nick a foot and put it in the field it does feel like whatever the explanation for the first one is that's also the explanation for the second one yeah, it definitely feels that way <laughs> Anyway, uh, nothing to do with video games, but that's the. <laughs> if we're all dead and footless uh, within the next few weeks, you'll know exactly why. Well, I'm fucking off to Sweden, so I should be fine. Yeah. I'm just going to a cabin in the woods with a thing where I had to just sign a disclaimer saying if I die, it's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> I liked also that they I asked you to take safe. two mobile phones. Yeah, but I. I don't know if it's a mistranslation or something, but they seem to suggest I need a spare mobile phone. Yeah, that's because the killer will destroy the first one. <laughs> keep the second one in your sock and your trainer, just, and then you can call for they're help. They're sick of watching horror movies where it's like, oh, all their mobile phones are out of signal or whatever. Anyway, so uh, soon to be there, Tom Francis. So, <laughs> <laughs> farewell from Hang the podcast. Hang on, you're all going to... I'm going to come back you all have no feet. <laughs> fine. Um, there are a couple of things we should mention. One is I forgot to say that we are recording this not in our usual studio, and so if the quality is not as good as normal that's because we're using a different mic um so don't complain because <laughs> we don't care <laughs> uh, the other is um i don't think anyone else have played inside right i'm gonna play no. inside. but that is out it's probably out at the time that you hear this i think mm. it's probably i out. hear it's fucking amazing it is, yeah and everyone says it's great and also even says that you should read nothing about it before you play it so oh, yeah. The fact that we can't talk about it is actually not a disadvantage. <laughs> maybe that'll be one of our pop out podcasts for people who. Yeah, maybe the first know. spoiler cast. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Although I won't be on it. Goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> well, just go and come in by the internet. You've got the internet in the woods. Yeah, we've never done that before. Um, there's, there's not any technical reason we can't do that, but it's a bit different. I suppose maybe if we were like a spoiler cast, it could work. It's like a one off thing. Yeah, we'll think about it. Um, anyway. If you'd like to send us questions, you can do so at questions at creatingcrowbar.com. We also have a forum at at creatingcrowbar.com slash forum that has a question subforum. Um, You can follow us on Twitter. We are at creatingcrowbar there. We have a Discord channel, which you can only really get at via our website because the link is too long to say out loud. Um, And you can follow us individually on Twitter. I'm at pentadact, P-E-N-T-A-D-A-C-T. Alex is... Rotational. Pretty easy to spell. Uh, Tom is uh, PC Ludo, which is Ludo. Thanks for listening, everybody.